American History by Judith Ortiz Kofer. I once read in a Ripley's Believe It or Not column that Patterson, New Jersey is the place where the straight and narrow streets intersect. The Puerto Rican tenement known as L Building was one block up from Straight. It was, in fact, at the corner of Straight and Market, not at the corner, but the corner. At almost every hour of the day, L Building was like a monstrous jukebox, blasting out salsas from an open window as the residents, mostly new immigrants just up from the island, trying to drown out whatever they were currently enduring with loud music. But the day that President Kennedy was shot, there was a profound silence in L Building. Even the abusive tongues of the Virago's cursing the unemployed and the screeching of small children had somehow muted. President Kennedy was a saint to these people. In fact, soon his photograph would be hung alongside the sacred heart and over spiritualist altars that many women kept in their apartments. He would become part of the hierarchy of martyrs they prayed to for favors that only one who had died for a cause could understand. On the day that President Kennedy was shot, my ninth grade class had been out in the fenced playground of public school number 13. We had been given free exercise time and had been ordered by our PE teacher, Mr. De Palma, to keep moving. That meant that the girls would jump rope and the boys would toss basketballs through a hoop at the far end of the yard. He, in the meantime, would keep an eye on us from just inside the building. It was a cold, gray day in Patterson, the kind that warns of early snow. I was miserable since I'd forgotten my gloves and my knuckles were turning red and raw from the jump rope. I was also taking a lot of abuse from the black girls for not turning the rope hard and fast enough for them. Hey, skinny bones, pump it up, girl. Ain't you got no energy today? Gail, the biggest of the black girls who had the other end of the rope yelled, didn't you eat your rice and beans and pork chops for breakfast today? The other girls picked up on the pork chops and made it into a refrain. Pork chop, pork chop, did you eat your pork chop? They entered the double ropes in pairs and exited without tripping or missing a beat. I felt a burning on my cheeks and then my glasses fogged up so I could not manage to coordinate the jump rope with Gail. The chill was doing to me what it always did, entering my bones, making me cry, humiliating me. I hated the city, especially in winter. I hated public school number 13. I hated my skinny, flat-chested body. I envied the black girls who could jump rope so fast that their legs became a blur. They always seemed to be warm while I froze. There was one source of beauty and light for me that school year the only thing I had anticipated at the start of the semester. That was seeing Eugene. In August, Eugene and his family had moved into the only house on the block that had a yard and trees. I could see his place from my window in L Building. In fact, if I sat on the fire escape, I was literally suspended above Eugene's backyard. It was my favorite spot to read my library books in the summer. Until that August, the house had been occupied by an old Jewish couple. Over the years, I had become a part of their family without their knowing it, of course. I had a view of their kitchen and their backyard, and though I could not hear what they said, I knew when they were arguing, when one of them was sick, and many other things. I knew all this by watching them at mealtimes. I could see their kitchen table, the sink, and the stove. During good times, he sat on the table and he read his newspapers while she fixed his meals. If they argued, he would leave and the old woman would sit there and stare at nothing for a long time. When one of them was sick, the other would come and get things from the kitchen and carry them out on his tray. The old man had died in June. The last week of school, I had not seen him at the table at all. And then one day I saw there was a crowd in the kitchen the old woman had finally emerged from the house on the arm of a stocky, middle-aged woman 
whom I had seen there a few times before. Maybe her daughter? Then a man had carried out suitcases. The house had stood empty for weeks. I had to resist the temptation to climb down into the yard and water the flowers that the old lady had taken such good care of. By the time Eugene's family moved in, the yard was a tangled mass of weeds. The father had spent several days mowing, and when he finished from where I sat, I didn't see the yellow, red, and purple clusters that meant flowers to me. I didn't see his family sit down at the kitchen table together. It was just the mother, a red-headed tall woman who wore a white uniform, a nurse's, I guessed it was. The father was gone before I got up in the morning and there was never and was never there at dinner time. I only saw him on the weekends when they sometimes sat on lawn chairs under the oak tree, each hidden behind a section of the newspaper. And then there was Eugene. He was tall and blonde and he wore glasses. I liked him right away because he sat at the kitchen table and read books for hours. That summer, before we'd ever spoken one word to each other, I kept him company on my fire escape. Once school started, I looked for him in all of my classes, but PS 13 was a huge overpopulated place and it took me days and many discreet questions to discover that Eugene was in honors classes for all of his subjects. Classes that were not open to me because English is not my first language. Though I was a straight A student, after much maneuvering, I managed to run into him in the hallway where his locker was on the other side of the building from mine. And in study hall in the library where he first seemed to notice me, but he did not speak. And finally on the way home after school one day when I decided to approach him directly, even though my stomach was turning somersaults, I was ready for rejection, snobbery, the worst. But when I came up to him, practically panning in my nervousness and blurted out, you're Eugene, right? He smiled. He pushed his glasses up on his nose and he nodded. I saw that he was blushing deeply. Eugene liked me, but he was shy. I did most of the talking that day. He nodded and smiled a lot. In the weeks that followed, we walked home together. He would linger at the corner of L building for a few minutes and then walk down to his two-story house. It was not until Eugene moved into the house that I had noticed that L building blocked most of the sun and the only spot that got a little sunlight during the day was the tiny square of earth the old woman had planted with flowers. I did not tell Eugene that I could see inside his kitchen from my bedroom. I felt dishonest, but I liked my secret sharing of his evenings, especially now that I knew what he was reading since we chose our books together at the school library. One day, my mother came into my room as I was sitting on the windowsill staring out. In her abrupt way, she said, Elena, you are acting moony. Amorada was what she really said that is, like a girl stupidly infatuated. Since I had turned 14, my mother had been more vigilant than ever. She acted as if I was going to go crazy or explode or something if she didn't watch me and nag me all the time about being a senorita now. She kept talking about virtue, morality, and other subjects that didn't interest me in the least. My mother was unhappy in Patterson, but my father had a good job at the blue jeans factory in Pasic. And soon, he kept assuring us, we would be moving out to our own house there. Every Sunday, we drove out to the suburbs of Patterson, Clifton, and Pasick, out to where people mowed grass on Sundays in the summer, and where children made snowmen in the winter from pure white snow, not like the gray slush of Patterson, which seemed to fall from the sky in that hue. I had learned to listen to my parents' dreams, which were spoken in Spanish as fairy tales, like the stories about life on the island paradise of Puerto Rico before I was born. I had been to the island once as a little girl to my grandmother's funeral, and all I remembered was wailing women in black and my mother being coming hysterical and being given a pill that made her sleep for two days and feeling lost in a cloud of strangers, all claiming to be my aunts, uncles, and cousins. 
I had actually been glad to return to the city. We had not been back there since then. Although my parents talked constantly about buying a house on the beach someday, retiring on the island, that was a common topic among the residents of L Building. As for me, I was going to college and become a teacher. But after meeting Eugene, I began to think of the present more than the future. What I wanted now was to enter that house I had watched for so many years. I wanted to see the other rooms where the old people had lived and where the boy spent his time. Most of all, I wanted to sit at the kitchen table with Eugene, like two adults, like the old man and his wife had done, maybe drink some coffee and, and talk about books. I had started reading Gone with the Wind. I was enthralled with it by the daring and the passion of the beautiful girl living in a mansion and with her devoted parents and the slaves who did everything for them. I didn't believe that such a world had ever really existed. And I wanted to ask Eugene some questions since he and his parents, he had told me, had come up from Georgia, the same place where the novel was sent. Set, sorry, the novel was set. His father worked for a company that had transferred him to Patterson. His mother was very unhappy, Eugene said in his beautiful voice that rose and fell over words in a strange, lilting way. The kids at school called him the hick and made fun of the way that he talked. I knew I was his only friend so far and I liked that, although I felt sad for him sometimes. Skinny bones and the hick was what they called us at school when we were seen together. The day that Mr. De Palma came out into the cold and asked us to line up in front of him was the day that President Kennedy was shot. Mr. De Palma, a short, muscular man with slicked down black hair, was the science teacher, the PE coach, and the disciplinarian at PS 13. He was the teacher to whose homeroom you got assigned to if you were a troublemaker. And the man called out to break up playground fights and to escort violently angry teenagers to the office. And Mr. De Palma was the man who called your parents in for a conference. That day, he stood in front of two rows of mostly black and Puerto Rican kids, brittle from their efforts to keep moving on a November day that was turning bitter cold. Mr. De Palma, to our complete shock, was crying not silent adult tears, but really sobbing. There were a few titters from the back of the line where I stood shivering. Listen, Mr. De Palma raised his hands over his head as if he was about to conduct an orchestra. His voice broke and he covered his face with his hands. His barrel chest was heaving. Some girls giggled behind me. Listen, he repeated, something awful has happened. A strange gurgling came from his throat and he turned around and he spat on the cement behind him. Gross, someone said, and there was a lot of laughter. The president is dead, you idiots. I should have known that wouldn't mean anything to a bunch of losers like you kids. Go home. He was shrieking now. No one moved for a minute or two. And then a big girl let out a yeah and ran to get her books piled up with the others against the brick wall of the school building. The others followed in a mad scramble to get their things before somebody caught on. It was still an hour till the dismissal bell. A little scared, I headed for El Building. There was an eerie feeling on the streets. I looked into Mario's drugstore, a favorite hangout for the high school crowd but there were only a couple of old Jewish men at the soda bar talking with the short order cook in tones that sounded almost angry, but they were keeping their voices low. Even the traffic on one of the busiest intersections in Patterson, Straight Street and Park Avenue, it seemed to be moving slower. There were no horns blasting that day. At L Building, there was usual, the usual group of unemployed men was not hanging out on the front stoop, making it difficult for women to enter the front door. No music spilled out from the open doors in the hallway. And when I walked into our apartment, I found my mother sitting in front of a grainy picture on the television set. 
She looked up at me with a tear-streaked face and just said, and just said, Dios mio, before looking back to the set as if it were pulling at her eyes. I went into my room. Though I wanted to feel the right thing about President Kennedy's death, I couldn't fight the feeling of elation that was stirring in my chest. Today was the day I would visit Eugene in his house. He had asked me to come over after school to study for an American history test with him. We had also planned to walk to the public library together. I looked down into his yard. The oak tree was bare of leaves and the ground looked gray with ice. The light through the large kitchen window of his house told me that El Building blocked the sun to such an extent that they had to turn on lights in the middle of the day. I felt ashamed about it, but the white kitchen table with the lamp hanging just above it looked cozy and inviting. I would soon sit there across from Eugene and I would tell him about my perch above his house. Maybe I should. In the next 30 minutes, I changed clothes. I put on a little pink lipstick and I got my books together. And then I went to tell my mother that I was going to a friend's house to study. I did not expect her reaction. You're going out today? The way she said today sounded as if a storm warning had been issued. It was said in utter disbelief. Before I could answer, she came towards me and held my elbows as I clutched my books. Iha, the president has been killed. We must show respect. He was a great man. Come to church with me tonight. She wanted to embrace me, but my books were in the way. My first impulse was to comfort her. She seemed so distraught. But I had to meet Eugene in 15 minutes. I have a test to study for, Mama. I'll be home by eight. You are forgetting who you are, Nina. I have seen you staring down at that boy's house. You are headed for humiliation and pain. My mother said this in Spanish and in a resigned tone that surprised me as if she had no intention of stopping me from heading from humiliation and pain. I started for the door. She sat in front of the TV holding a white handkerchief to her face. I walked out to the street and around the chain link fence that separated L building from Eugene's house. The yard was neatly edged around the little walk that led to the door. It always amazed me how Patterson, the inner core of the city, had no apparent logic to its architecture. Small, neat, single residences like this one could be found right next to huge, dilapidated apartment buildings like L building. My guess is, is that the little houses had been there first, and then the immigrants had come in droves, and the monstrosities had been raised for them. The Italians, the Irish, the Jews, and now us, the Puerto Ricans, and the Blacks. The door was painted a deep green, verde, the color of hope, and I heard my mother say it, verde esperanza. I knocked softly. A few suspenseful moments later, the door opened, just a crack. The red, swollen face of a woman appeared. She had a halo of red hair floating over a delicate ivory face, the face of a doll with freckles on the nose. Her smudged eye makeup made her look unreal to me, like a mannequin seen through a warped store window. What do you want? Her voice was tiny and sweet sounding, like a little girl's, but her tone was not friendly. I'm Eugene's friend. He asked me over to study. I thrust out my books, a silly gesture that embarrassed me almost immediately. You live there? She pointed up at L Building, which looked particularly ugly, like a gray prison with its many dirty windows and rusty fire escapes. The woman stepped halfway out, and I could see that she wore a white nurse's uniform with St. Joseph's Hospital on the tag. Yes, I, I do. She looked intently at me for a couple of heartbeats and then said as if to herself, I don't know how you people do it. Then directly to me, listen, honey, Eugene doesn't want to study with you. He's a smart boy, doesn't need help. You understand me? I'm truly sorry if he told you that you could come over. He can't study with you. 
It's nothing personal, you understand? We won't be in this place much longer. No need for him to get close to people. It'll just make it harder for him later. Run back home now. I couldn't move. I just stood there in shock at hearing these things said to me in such a honey-drenched voice. I had never heard an accent like hers, except for Eugene's softer version. It was as if she was singing a little song. What's wrong? Didn't you hear what I said? She seemed angry, and I snapped out of my trance. I turned away from the green door, and I heard her close it gently. Our apartment was empty when I got home. My mother was in someone else's kitchen, seeking the solace that she needed. Father would come in from his late shift at midnight. I would hear them talking softly in the kitchen for hours that night. They could not discuss their dreams for the future or life in Puerto Rico as they often did. That night, they would talk sadly about the young widow and her two children as if they were family. For the next few days, we would observe luto in our apartment. That is, we would practice restraint and silence. No loud music or laughter. Some of the women in El Building would wear black for weeks. That night, I lay in my bed, trying to feel the right thing for our dead president. But the tears that came up from a deep source within me were strictly for me. When my mother came to the door, I pretended to be sleeping. Sometime during the night, I saw from my bed that the street light had come on. It had a pink halo around it. I went to my window and I pressed my face to the cool glass. Looking up at the light, I could see white snow falling like a lace veil over its face. I did not look down to see it turning gray as it touched the ground below.